Welcome back to the Unleashing. <clears throat> this video, I want to talk about uh, the ancient trees that were before the flood. Now, uh, I've been working on this for over a year now. And even though I knew about ancient trees and uh, I had uh, been around Devil's Tower and stuff like that and seen uh, pictures <clears throat> that are up on the internet of what looks like petrified trees around the world, the extent of them and uh, some of the uh, information that's I feel been given to me by God on this subject is uh, really growing to like uh, astronomical proportions, <laughs> coincidentally, just like the ancient trees. But uh, I want to share some of this, and uh, like I say, it's uh, it's something I've been kind of working on for about a year, and uh, that's because it kind of started about a year ago, and, and I've wanted to, to talk about it. Uh, if you've never heard this subject before or ever seen it, uh, it's uh, absolutely incredible, totally fascinating, and uh, just goes to show you the awesomeness of God. He really likes to make things uh, uh, awesome and big, and there's nothing small. <laughs> there's nothing small about it. It's uh, it's amazing his work, and. Uh, gets back to what I've always said, uh, heaven, uh, the thousand year reign, uh, the stuff that he has planned, it's, uh, it's going to be, um, epic, um, totally extraordinary in proportion and size and, uh, way bigger than anybody can imagine or grasp and, and, uh, what usually gets played out with harps on clouds and boringness that, that people don't want to have anything to do with. If they actually knew how it was, it'd be, uh, just as interested and, uh, excited as Christians are waiting for the Lord's return. But, um, uh, um, I just want to go over this and you know I got uh, different uh, different video clips and other things like that that I've kind of comprised together and I'm just going to kind of go through the whole thing and share it with you guys so uh, let's get started it was uh, <clears throat> it was last year I had uh, left northern Idaho and uh, I went down to Missouri and I was uh, staying with my sister for a while and uh, it didn't work out and I ended up leaving there and uh, Checking out a couple other things in the area while I was there, caves and some other stuff like that. I got to go see the Noah's Ark that was over in Kentucky. That was totally incredible. Uh, that was really great to see that. That was super fun. Um, but on the way back, uh, I was going through New Mexico, and I was just checking different sites out and stuff like that. And along the way, um, I noticed uh, where Chaco Canyon was, and it's been something that's been on my uh, to-check-out list for a long time, and it's out in the middle of nowhere in northwestern uh, New Mexico, uh, kind of uh, south of the, the Four Corners, right? Well, uh, I uh, I checked out a few different places, went to Roswell and stuff like that, but on my way, I went up there and stayed, and it was March, and it was still winter time. And uh, thankfully, I mean, it was like desert weather. It's cold out there, but it was sunny and nice. And uh, <clears throat> I had the whole place to myself, basically. I was, like, the only one uh, brave enough to be camping out there in those temperatures. And uh, anyways, so I stopped and, uh, and I checked it out. And on the way there, I uh, told God, because you guys have seen many writers from Steve Quayle, Tom Horn, uh, Timothy Alberino, and stuff like that. These guys have checked all these places. Uh, no one uh, uh, of possible occultism, them opening up portals, allowing uh, giants, Nephilim, fallen entities and things like that to come through, which ended up chasing them out of these areas, right? But I wanted to check it out. And uh, on the way there, I asked God, I was like, hey, God, I'm like, if there's something there you want me to see, uh, because a lot of times he'll show me stuff that other people don't notice, don't pick up, don't see, and stuff like that. Uh, I'm like, go ahead and uh, show it to me. That'd be super cool. And uh, you know me, <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll share it. I'll share it. And uh, so that's just what I said before I went there, right? And of course, this is me. <laughs> over a year later, uh, or about a year later, uh, bringing that information forward that he showed me, because like I said, I told him that I would, and I wasn't sure when I was going to do it, um, but uh, but now is a really good time, so anyways, so I show up to Chaco Canyon, and I stay there, I get my camping spot, and uh, hiked for over like 20 miles when I was there, all over the place, checked the whole thing out, and while I'm checking out that ancient ruins and stuff there, Lo and behold, what I discovered was petrification all over the place. And what at first looked like one piece of wood here and another there, which they acknowledge inside uh, their uh, little uh, um, uh, museum, right? They acknowledge that there's some petrification stuff there. What I didn't realize was how extent it was, even to the extent that I believe that... Uh, 
the the actual people that live there, the natives, they built their structures after what they saw in the wall, which you'll see is piling on of rocks and uh, lumber throughout that doesn't have a strategic purpose in some areas. Uh, they, I believe they copied it from the wall, almost treating the wall, uh, one of the canyon walls there, almost like a god or something like that. So it's kind of crazy. But uh, anyways, started seeing petrification popping out all over the place only to dis discover that the wall the whole canyon was a gigantic petrified log jam uh during the flood that got washed mixed with mud sand and stuff like that and uh and all fossilized turned to rock right if you guys don't know how this works uh when a log or an organic material is petrified it has to be buried and covered extremely fast and quick it can't just sit there uh, and rot which is why the whole uh, millions of years thing with creaceous uh, Jurassic um, other periods of time and a tree that's like 200 years old growing up through the middle of those millions of years periods and then you go into that tree and you see that it only has like uh, uh, 200 rings or whatever in it so it's like a 200 year old tree growing up through millions of years uh, you understand that, that can't happen it would have rotted away the only way for that is to be submerged instantly and uh, which is what happened in the mu uh, in the flood right um, <clears throat> but uh, Within within that, like uh, they they they've said this that uh, that this fossilized or whatever, and it took millions of years. When really it didn't, it took a matter of moments. Like and it happened extremely fast. But when the sediment, the minerals, and things are around it, they actually go into the wood and it replaces the organic material with uh, with actual. Uh, minerals all right so the log will turn into uh sometimes gemstones the wood will turn into it uh pine cones uh that are completely solid rock right they'll have gemstones inside where the seeds are uh um your sap will become like quartz and other things like that it's very uh very cool very unique when you find it right and uh anyways but uh and it can happen extremely fast now these places that are uh, around the world where you see these basalt columns like devil's tower for instance um and you see these huge columns and they say it's basalt from lava and then over millions of years it heated and cooled heated and cooled and it fractured into these octog octagonal shapes and stuff like that the problem is is that we cannot see this in our time being reproduced whether it's hawaii or anywhere else with these basalt columns where you do see it on a miniature level is the cell walls of organic material like like trees for instance and we can see that happening and it happened relatively fast right so when you see these places with these huge basalt columns around the world with these uh, gigantic trees and stuff all right you uh, start to you start to get a grasp but this was never lava it wasn't cooling over millions of years it happened during the flood and these these actual basalt columns aren't columns of uh, of lava or basalt or anything like that it's the mineralization that happens from the organic material that's traded out during that okay and uh, and it's absolutely incredible when you notice it when you see it because and it's kind of tricky to see at first you're looking at uh, rocks that are completely petrified solid stone but when it starts to pop out and you can envision what the original color looked like and you can see it uh it it changes everything your mind's like blowing like wow this is crazy and it's huge and of course there's smaller trees and stuff like that but the cool part is a lot of these trees that were pre-flood uh especially some of the select few were absolutely gigantic up at absolutely enormous okay uh and i want to show you like some different pictures and stuff like that um but before we do uh let me take you to chaco canyon here and uh, i'll let you guys see what i recorded it's kind of a compilation of me walking around the cliffside and getting some different shots uh but you can see the petrification and stuff that takes place and it's about 13 minutes long but uh you can see kind of what i'm talking about and uh and it's very awesome so here check this out in chaco canyon right now Doing a little exploring. Thought I'd stop by and check this place out. Kind of wanted to see it for a while. I happened to be in the area looking at the old ruins. But uh, come to find out, the biggest surprise that I found, and what I think is the most fascinating about this place, is the amount of petrification we have here. It is literally on the entire walls of this whole canyon. It's absolutely incredible. I've never seen so much petrified wood, seashells, aquatic life ever in one spot it's absolutely amazing 
I brought this up in the little uh, visitor center. Of course, those guys would be happy to say, 75 million years ago, this was a floodplain, blah, 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 completely denying the fact that some of these petrified things, these stumps that they have, are literally upright, standing upright. And uh, I don't know why it's so hard to understand. You aren't going to have that happen in an instant. It's going to take millions of years. It's going to rot away. It has to happen instantly. It has to be covered and preserved in just the right conditions. Same with Devil's Tower. What we have here is an absolutely incredible, incredible leftover scene from Noah's flood and the washout of some of these trees and uh, the sea life and everything else that was just buried instantly. And when the flood receded, literally cutting off some of this wall, left this petrified wood in the side of these walls. And it's just amazing, absolutely amazing to see and was completely unexpected. Uh, but I wanted to uh, get some shots of this. And uh, some of these trees are gigantic. It's pretty amazing to look at. Okay, I'm in Chaco Canyon right now. <clears throat> the most amazing thing that I've seen is the petrification in this place. That log right there is completely petrified, sticking out of the wall. And I discovered while I'm here, the entire place is just filled with the signs of Noah's flood, I had to come back and get a closer look at some of this stuff. My uh, camera phone just wasn't cutting it. Absolutely amazing. Wow, one of the places I can't walk to. Just so much. It's just incredible. This entire wall system is just filled with petrified trees that were washed out in mud during the flood. Absolutely incredible. I've never seen a collection of so many petrified trees. The entire wall is just covered with them. Amazing. Okay, I'm at a really good vantage point right here. Man, the size of this tree. Absolutely incredible. You can see the growth rings inside of it, the bark. If I zoom in over here, this one's spectacular. You can literally see the splintering in the wood. It's been petrified. Absolutely incredible. All these are just sticking out of the wall. Literally got washed by the flood, compacted, stuck in the mud, and then when this drained out, left these just here in the side. Absolutely incredible. There's some hieroglyphs, and I'm not even interested in those. <laughs> There's a better view of the other side of that splintered wood. Amazing. Look at the bark. Like cedar almost. Incredible. All petrified. Amazing.
absolutely amazing. Well, I didn't even see this one. That right there is one big tree. You can see the knot coming off of it right there. Incredible, this thing stretches that whole upper part. Amazing. Look at that. Gap broke off right there. Continues back on. Piece of bark. Wow. All petrified. That thing's huge. After stepping back and looking at this as a whole, there is a strong possibility that this, all these little, which look like logs coming out everywhere, are actually the branches from that huge tree when it was knocked over and petrified in the mud during the flood. That's incredible. Some big trees back then. Amazing. of bark my gosh that is awesome it is huge of course I can't walk over there amazing this whole wall literally looks like one big tree that had laid down I think that's exactly what it is. Wow. That's huge. Just amazing. They're all petrified wood everywhere. Either trees or branches coming out from the big tree. The whole rock wall looks like one big tree. Wow, dude. Amazing. And it literally might be, and those might just be all the branches coming out. Incredible. That is one big tree right there. You can see the bark around the outside towards the bottom. As you work your way up, some of the wood that you see inside, along with other parts of bark and things. Wow. Inner rings, knots. Amazing. The whole cliff looks like one big tree and it laid down. Branches stuck in the dirt. Held everything behind it in place and while the rest washed out. That's what it looks like. That is a big tree right there. My gosh. Look at this tree. I mean, I'm blown away. Look at this tree. That thing is huge. You can see the growth rings as you follow it up. Look. Look at that. You can literally see the rings. This is one gigantic tree. Dang. <laughs> they won't tell you this on the tour. Holy mackerel. That is incredible. This baby's in competition with Devil's Tower. Amazing. Look 
petrified bark and rings everywhere. Incredible. There's another branch broken off. Wow. And the growth rings were a lot bigger back in the day. That is one growth ring right there. Chipping off. have a huge boulder that is broken off from the wall. But if you look closely, you will notice, yet again, it's a gigantic piece of wood that's been petrified. The whole boulder is that broke off from the wall, all from that big tree. That is incredible, the size of that thing. You can see the growth rings and the whole thing. From back here, you can get a scope of the size of this thing. It encompasses this whole rock wall. That is gigantic. I'm on the way far north end of this whole uh, thing, checking out this rock wall. Amazing. You can literally see it along the whole thing. A lot of them are still protruding out. Look at that. Incredible. I mean, it's just everywhere. It's like an ancient log jam. And they just got buried. <laughs> I mean, it's even on this bowl that broke off. Look at that. That's incredible. So many petrified trees. Absolutely amazing. This looks like a bark layer. Branch is coming out. Oh, wow, look at that. It's just everywhere. Now, as you can see, that's absolutely incredible, um, the petrification stuff that takes place. And if you can't tell the certain parts of the wall on the width of it or thinking, yeah, maybe you're just looking at sediment layers, which I can understand because of the sedimentation that took place during the flood. I can completely agree with that. Where you get to what I'm saying is, is you cannot have pieces of bark as large as they are if they didn't come from a gigantic tree. Let me show you. This bark here looks like it's from a fir tree or possibly a ponderosa pine and just like the corky look of a fir tree when you break off a piece of the bark which is about hand grip uh, you can see it on the, the bottom of uh, the side there and the little porous holes and stuff like that. Uh, now what I have here is a piece of ponderosa pine bark right fits in my hand just like this right? and you can see it if you've been around ponderosa pines the bigger the tree the bigger the hand grip. When you find these pieces, like I just showed you, of uh, a piece of bark that's broken off and it's larger than my truck, <laughs> that hand piece is growing and you can grow the size too with, uh, with the size of these trees. And when you realize it, when you can actually see it and envision it, you're like, holy mackerel, those things are huge. And Devil's Tower, for instance, being gigantic, I think about a mile around the base of it, uh, is relatively small compared to some of these other trees, which is just mind blowing to think about that they could actually be that big. You could literally have cities built in the trees and uh, the eagles and stuff that were back then to be able to nest in them uh, is pretty amazing uh, to think about, but it's cool. And you can see the different shapes 
um, you know, of, uh, of the bark and the petrification that takes place, and it's absolutely identical on the larger scale. Pretty amazing. Um, but, uh, but super cool to see. But starting with that, you know, it's only growing, and, uh, and I've got to see now through, through this last year just how big some of these things are and uh, the actual size and scope, if you can grasp it, which just, you can't see it because you could be walking through a mountain and uh, you're thinking that they're rock formations and stuff like that, but when you actually see it and the size and the scope, these huge protrusions of rock that are sticking out are actually like bark and the mountain itself is an ancient tree stump. Uh, in a lot of places now uh, there's people out there that think that every mountain was trees and, and giants and I, I totally agree that uh, there's a lot of these mountains out there that are ancient tree stumps that were cut down and uh, there's actually giants that are buried inside there as well all right from before the flood the big ones the really big ones that were like a couple miles high all right um, but every mountain isn't that way at all and <clears throat> if you guys have seen the crustal displacement from Kent Hoven or uh, uh, ham from the, the Noah's Ark thing um, and the diagrams and stuff like that that happened when the water broke loose from the earth from the Pacific and Atlantic ridges uh, and the, the sliding that took place and the upheaval of the mountainsides uh, you can understand that a lot of this is actual uh, rock and mud and dirt formations that have taken place and and uh, created these ridge lines and stuff like that and it's totally real and then the washout from the flood when it settled back into these basins created on a larger scale and some of these mountain formations the same thing you see on a smaller scale and uh, uh, sand formations and dirt formations and stuff like that after a flooding that takes place right or on a beach or something like that you can totally see it right but a lot of these are actually as well mountains that are been petrified which are tree stumps that have dirt on top of them mud or whatever and it's been left for time and you can see the basalt uh, columns that are from the organic material from the tree all right and uh and it's pretty amazing because uh, there's a lot of them all over the place in different parts of the world and uh there's probably a lot that they haven't discovered but a lot of them have and uh and it's it's pretty phenomenal to see it it's cool <clears throat> now while I've been looking at this and checking it out, there's something that's kind of popped out with these whole, this whole tree thing as well, and that is the connection with them, what I feel like as to, they are to kings. A lot of times when you find these trees uh, where they're at, excuse me, you'll find the seedlings of them are all around them on a miniature scale for instance devil's tower when you're around it and you're checking it out it looks like a pon uh, ponderosa pine right lo and behold all the trees that grow out around the space of this thing in that area are nothing but ponderosa pines on a smaller scale right you are driving in other areas and what looks like would have been a gigantic cottonwood and it's a mountain right and the whole wall has got that whole bark look to it where it hasn't been distorted by anybody digging or anything like that it's built into it and you look and behold uh you find like cottonwoods growing all around that area the bark matches it on a smaller scale identically right or a cedar or anything else right for that matter and i'd like to find a redwood that would be awesome those things are already big enough as it is but to find a one the size of a mountain that'd be incredible the size of these things though uh it just it's beyond measure when you look at a base and a tree and stuff like that if it's a, a couple feet wide and you look at its height 50 feet 40 feet tall and bigger ones like a ponderosa or whatever maybe five feet in diameter 80 feet 100 feet tall when you start seeing some of these mountains and these uh, tree stumps that are three miles four miles five miles in diameter at the base and you calculate the height uh, you could be looking at something that's 80 or so miles high, which just blows past anything you can possibly imagine. We look at clouds, and the highest ones are about 7 miles. This thing is above the clouds. Uh, oxygen level during the flood or before the flood, just through the roof. Just through the roof. No wonder people were living so long. I mean, these things are just pumping out like factories. But... Uh, Within that, looking at the uniqueness of these individual trees, because they all weren't like that, just select individual ones, almost like they were the king of trees. It got me thinking about uh, 
uh, some of the scripture where trees are mentioned and I want to read it to you uh, and so you can see kind of my point where I'm coming from in the Bible that multi-dimensionalism that I mention all the time is absolutely incredible you're reading a scripture Jesus is saying something and it has its point right there right then and you also think he's also talking to him back then it's like wow it's amazing he could be telling them then that that's relevant and it has something to do with you now right and it's like, wow, that's like two different places in time he's speaking at once. Then an analogy that has to do with something else, which can be represented absolutely figuratively in something in another area, as well as another and another and another. It's so poetic that we can't even grasp it. Only sometimes do individuals digging into the scripture, lo and behold, discover like this means 50 different things at once. And not only that, it's hidden throughout time, only something that God could do, and it's absolutely incredible, right? And and I've talked about this lots of times, you know, and you know what I'm talking about. It's it's amazing what his multi-dimensional, what he's spoken or saying, also is a representation of other things, and also historically, right? And I want to bring that to the point, and the representation of uh, these trees correlating with kings throughout time, right? Because it's... There's definitely something there, and uh, and it's almost like they have stood a test of time. They are the figurative example of the kings that have been throughout time on this planet, right? The larger than life, bigger than the other trees, right? Uh, stand out. All right, let me let me give you an example here. What I'm talking about, okay? When you start to see the size of these trees, right? Uh, you know that they're astronomically huge, just gigantic. And uh, just like that with the kings here, I want to read, starting in Daniel, right? Daniel 20. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, right? And Daniel's doing the interpretation of it right now. And it's Daniel 4, 20. The tree that I saw, which thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached up into heaven, and a sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit uh, thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of heaven had their inhabitation. It is though it is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown, and reachest unto heaven thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down, destroy it, yet leave the stump and the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let this portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon <clears throat> my lord the king. All right? Daniel's giving us some interpretation, right? But who comes in the dream to cut down the tree? A watcher, the angels, which in the book of Enoch is exactly what happened. It was the giants, the fallen angels, that cut down the tree as they hewed them down. So even though this is a few thousand years later, a thousand or maybe two thousand years later, right, almost, he is getting this message in this dream, and he's speaking metaphorically of him using the tree as an example. Yet the tree story from the dream is real in its own way, multidimensionalist. It's telling a story of history and being used as an example. And it's a hidden story at that because they don't know how big the trees were, right? It's very interesting and you can see my correlation that I'm trying to talk about here how like these were representations of kings I'm gonna keep hitting this until you uh, well go wow that really is an example and that's so interesting the multi-dimensional God's a poet and the way he's put everything together we don't even grasp we see it dimly lit right but in heaven when you see how he structured the whole thing almost like the correlation of the Bible verses how they cross over you guys have seen that picture and how it's amazing when we see the whole spectrum of what God did how he made it the representation of different things including past present and the future tied it all together uh, from multi-dimensional it the word that he spoke and died it's just you're gonna be blown away your jaw is just gonna drop like no way that that all fits together that's amazing we don't even know it I don't even know it. but sometimes you can see just a little bit of it and it's incredible to see so that's the Daniel correlation all right that I'm talking about with the trees now I want to go to Ezekiel 31 and uh, read that a little bit. Let me show you. Okay, this is Ezekiel chapter 31 
And this is a representation, instead of Nebuchadnezzar, it's to Pharaoh, all right? He's the tree this time. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, <coughs> king of Egypt, and to his multum, whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon, which with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud, <coughs> and of a high stature, his top was among the thick bows. The water made him great, the deep. And just to throw this in there, a little snippet, uh, if you guys have heard of uh, aquaponics or whatever, where you use water to feed uh, plants and stuff like that, and they can grow faster and stuff like that, the amount of water under the crust, especially before the flood, imagine the roots going down to there and the earth just pumping that fresh water, these things. I uh, just want to throw that out there. All right. Anyways, the waters made him great. The deep set him on high with her rivers running round about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore, his height was exceed exalted above all the trees of the field and his bows were multiplied and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth all the fowls of heaven made their nests in the bows and under the branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young and under the shadow dwelt the great <coughs> all the great nations all right these trees were huge and even though it's an example like you could build cities out of these things and it'd be like shade all right Thus was fair in the greatness, in the length of the branches, for its roots were by, was by great waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his bows, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches. Nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden envied him. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he hath uh, shot up in his uh, top among the thick bows, and his heart is lifted up in his height i have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen he shall surely deal with them i have driven him out in wickedness and strangers the terrible of nations have um, cut him off and have left him upon the mountains and all the valleys his branches are fallen his bows are broken off by the rivers of the land and all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him upon his ruin shall all the fells of heaven remain all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches to the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for the height, neither shoot up their tops among the thick bows, neither their trees stand up in the height. All that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death, to the nether parts of the earth, in the midst of the children of men, with them that go down to the pit. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning, I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed, and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall, when I cast him down to hell with them that descended into the pit, and all the trees of Eden, the choice and all the best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down to the hell with him, unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were uh, his arm that dwelt under the shadow in the midst of a heathen. To whom art thou thus like the glory and the greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Eden under the nether parts of the earth. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. All right. Yet again, another example of a king. Obviously, multidimensionalism there. Uh, possibly references to the Antichrist and Lucifer at the same time. While talking about a tree, which very well could be historically one of them, all right? And using it as an example. And Pharaoh all at the same time. Boom. Multidimensionalism through the roof, right? And it's amazing how God does it because we can't even pick it up or see the thing. When you can later or we're in heaven and we're seeing the history and stuff like that, when you watch it all correlate together multidimensionally through time it's gonna blow your mind it's totally amazing right and so cool all right to throw in some of the the trees we're not just talking about one type of tree like devil's tower being a ponderosa or uh, some of the others being like uh, cottonwoods there were cedars firs there's kings of all the versions right him talking about it. a little snippet here in Enoch in the book of Enoch he gets shown right Eden and the tree of wisdom, which I believe is giving a reference to the tree of knowledge. And this is uh, back uh, back before the flood, right? And he gets to see it in the garden. Well, these trees were not small. When you think of the little bush that it shows a little creek coming out like in heaven, like the tree of life and stuff like that. Uh, 
you're thinking too small. These things were gigantic. Well, he sees the tree of life in Eden, and he also gets to see the tree of wisdom, which I think is the tree of uh, knowledge, right? Good and evil. Well, it's a gigantic, from what he can see, it looks like a gigantic fir tree. If you guys have ever seen it before, it's like a quirky pine tree. But this thing is ginormous and huge. And the fruit that's on it, we've always thought of uh, the tree of knowledge like an apple, right? And Eve eating it, and Adam and Eve. Um, he said look, look look more like pods of cocoa, right? That's chocolate. It's a, it's a form of like chocolate. It's a little bit sweeter, right? And that that looks like what it is, and it smelled amazing. Wouldn't that be interesting if Eve was actually tempted by chocolate? <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. It was a downfall right from the start. Oh, man. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> but it, it's very interesting that that's what he sees, right? And the whole little serpent in the bush uh, very well could have been one of these huge trees and a dragon the size of uh, a tanker, uh, which is something I want to get into with the last dream that I just had, and it's going to be a topic for something else uh, with dragons, um, but very well could have been absolutely huge that we're talking about, and uh, the fruit that they ate of might have actually been like some sort of form of chocolate. Just kind of interesting, a little something there that I wanted to throw out, but uh, anyways... It is interesting to see the gigantic trees that are put into our culture, almost like there's a part of us that's calling back. And uh, whether it's imagination or whatever else, we, we can feel it. And only in what seems like imagination, uh, we could be stemming back to what was, what was actually reality, right? Whether it's Zelda and the Great Dooku Tree, all right, that's put into video games, or Final Fantasy IX and uh, the World Tree, or Avatar and the gigantic trees that they live in, all right, which is absolutely dinky compared to the ones that were here on Earth uh, back before the flood. Uh, there's uh, there's definitely something there. There's a correlation to it, like a calling back to it. Nothing's new under the sun, right? And uh, it's uh, it's very very it's very interesting. But uh, I want to show you some of these pictures, all right, I'm just going to show some slides here, of uh, these different uh, trees from all over the world, tree stumps that have been fossilized, all right, some of them are huge, there's root systems, um, but it's amazing, the size of them, all right, and uh, you can go ahead and uh, check it out and see uh, and see this for yourself, but uh, when you see it and the size and the scope of this, you'll understand that uh, there was nothing small about these things, they could have gone up for 100 miles into the sky, the whole structure of the earth was different, so... Uh, check this out.
And as you can see, <clears throat> it's amazing. The size and sculpt is just, it's mesmerizing. Wait until you get to see this when God restores the earth or the other areas that he's going to fix up or heaven. There's nothing small in scope. We uh, serve an absolutely huge God and uh, his ability to do things are on a magnitude we can't even comprehend uh, in the form and uh, being human that we're in right now. It's just, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. But uh, it's always been uh, amazing and it's only going to be more amazing. Along the spirit of the fallen angels, the watchers, the giants cutting down the trees, another correlation I want to put to this is, if you guys do not know where cannibalism and that spirit comes from, the first time that cannibalism is mentioned is from the, the giants. All right, They were starving, they couldn't eat enough, and they started to eat flesh of men, and they started to cannibalize. All right, And this is the first time you hear about it. For all that you know, all right, a giant's whatever size he is or any sort of cryptid creation that they they mix its disembodied spirit is what we know as a demon right when you start to see the cannibalism that takes place throughout our history of time whether it's tribes that are doing some uh opening up stuff portals and other things like that they're being demon possessed and the same spirit is still doing the same thing and you can see where it comes from right whether it's are elites that are Illuminati ruling the earth and the sacrifices they do and the partaking and eating flesh, all right, which is disgusting, that they still do. They're getting that from the disembodied spirits that are demons that are inside of them, all right? And the same thing is continuing. Why am I bringing this up? Because it's on more fronts than just that. During this whole liberal movement of them cutting down the statues of men of grade that, uh, you know, uh, started, founded America, the country, and this spirit that's in him to do that. It is the exact same spirit from the same spirits that cut down the ancient trees in the first place. And when you see that correlation there, you realize, oh my gosh, they're doing the same thing now on a smaller form. They just want to destroy anything that's good at all times, right? They have a spirit of destruction that's inside of them. And, uh, and it's still it's still taking place to this day and you wonder why where does it come from what's going through their minds and stuff like that they're being influenced by a demonic all right liberalism it's an abomination <laughs> if you don't already know that um all right it's a it's a complete downfall of society all right and uh it's mentioned in the bible um that uh that it's not going to be the liberal i can't think of what the exact verse is i might put it up if i if i think about it but uh it's never it's never looked at as a good thing all right and it's still it still has a spirit of that and it's uh it's built inside these people and to top this off right to see these trees and stuff like that i mean it's it's amazing the size and scope of them and we can't even imagine how big it's really going to get but as a reference of kings speaking of kings being metaphorically spoken of and physically put in place could each one of these gigantic trees represent an ancient king or a king that we've had a ruler throughout time before the, these watchers fallen angels cut them down because they hate men they knew it was coming. They knew the rule that we would have, the part that we're going to play for God, and they hated it right from the start, and they tried to destroy it. I absolutely believe so. I think that each one was a representation before they cut them down. And how can I put this cherry on top at the end? The tree of life, which is in heaven. From it, all the fruits of the nations that are growing each month with a new one. I don't think it's a bush. I think it's it's probably the biggest tree of all. And from it flows the river of life, right? This tree is the physical example. It's his. It is the king's. You see, it's the king's tree. It is God. It's the physical example of God being the ultimate king. When you see this tree, uh, just like uh, when uh, Enoch was showing it, he said it was beautiful from every angle that he could see it. Every single angle, just almost like multi-dimensional, looked better. And the leaves were almost like fire and light. And the fruit, 
which changes with the months and the time was able to feed and the leaves to heal the nations. You see the tree is God. It's another example on his poetics, his poetic masterpiece that he's created. It's the physical example in almost a statue form or uh, an organic form that he represents. Just like we see where He's referenced as the lion of the tribe of Judah. From an animal perspective, he's the lion. He's the king animal, right? And it's God that we're talking about. Well, on the plant side, he is the tree of life, all right? And uh, I hope that you can kind of see this now because it's it's absolutely uh, beautiful when you look at it that way. It's like, wow, that's, uh, that's amazing. And uh, it's only going to make it even more cool when you see that that tree of life, when you see it, is it's his representation. It is him. All right. That's his king tree. That's the one that represents him. Whereas others might have represented other, other, other kings throughout time. Uh, the tree of life is the one that represents uh, Almighty God himself. And that's why it's going to be the biggest and most awesome tree of all. And I can't wait to see it. It's going to be really cool. But uh, anyways, I uh, hope this sheds a little light on this subject. If you've never heard about this stuff before, it is pretty amazing. And uh, it's really cool to find him and see it. Um, as a little side note here, when I was making this video, I was working on it. I asked God to kind of help me with this. And uh, and uh, the very load, because I'm trucking, uh, that I had to go get, I picked up. I drove around the mountain of Magna, uh, Utah, south of Salt Lake, uh, the lake itself, over to uh, Thule or whatever. That whole mountain range there, about eight miles, uh, five to eight miles, is an ancient tree stump. It looked like it was a ponderosa, and the boulders that are crashed around there uh, are pieces of bark. And uh, you can see it when you look at it. If you like compare it to a piece of ponderosa, it'll start to pop out some of the ridge lines and stuff like that, where you can see the bark. It's exactly the same. So. I'm like, no way. And uh, I looked, I just scrolled in there and people had taken pictures of hiking up to the top. What's up there? Petrified coral and other things like that. Whenever you see stuff like that, whether it's seashells, coral, and other stuff like that, it means the environment was just right at that time to be covered and petrified with the minerals that it needed. When you see that, it's a dead giveaway. If you think that what looks like a dead or a tree that's been petrified and you start to see petrified other things that are easily recognizable whether it's seashells coral or whatever else and it's been petrified to solid stone you know you're in the right area and uh, it was the right thing and that's what it was so he took me around the route over to Seattle and down and uh, coming east of Portland I never noticed it before but that whole corridor is filled with uh, ancient cottonwoods and cedar trees all petrified some of those mountains are absolutely gigantic and uh, driving through some of the root systems where they cut out the trees you can see it right on the side of the walls uh, just like some of the other big trees and uh, it's amazing it's just like wow I can't believe I didn't notice this before some of the islands out there are actually uh, tree stumps and uh, it's uh, it's just more amazing stuff um, the whole picture and the scope of it, it's uh, bigger than people can imagine but uh, anyways hope to shed some light on the subject and uh, and you guys enjoyed this video I'll catch you next time on the leashing God bless Bye.